Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 5th, 2009, and my guest is Eric Hanischek, the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. His most recent book with Alfred Linseth is Schoolhouses, Courthouses, and State Houses, Solving the Funding Achievement Puzzle in America's Public Schools. Rick, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me. To get us started, I'd like you to give us an overview of what's been happening over the last few years in the political economy of education, the interface between the political process and the educational system? Well, the big event, of course, is the federal involvement through No Child Left Behind Act. This insisted that all states have test-based accountability for schools and put in to law a variety of things that had to be done if kids were failing in schools. Now, that uh, law actually just put in place uh, something that had been done by a vast majority of the states before the law went into effect. So it's a continuation. And it's putting a federal stamp on that, which has other implications, presumably, than just state programs. Absolutely. Uh, The federal stamp is important because schooling has been a state policy, and states delegate a lot to local districts, of course. But the federal government has traditionally just put money into some specialized programs, most notably compensatory programs for disadvantaged kids and special education programs. But with uh, President George Bush's first major domestic legislation, the federal government got deeper involved into policy itself by specifying what kids should know and what the states had to do in order to get their compensatory money. And when did that start, the No Child Left Behind Act? When did that pass, and is it still in effect? It was passed in January of 2002, and it is still in effect. It, it, but he's not president anymore, doesn't it? Just wither on the vine like everything else, uh, President Bush? No, I'm just kidding, but, uh, but it's still in effect. Yeah, it is. Um, it is embedded in the major federal legislation that that's actually has its antecedents with Lyndon Johnson in 1965, but it specifies what happens in the future. It has to be reauthorized, but as with many laws, things that aren't reauthorized just keep going. Yeah, and I I was joking about weathering on the vine. Of course, a lot of policies of the Bush administration in the economic sphere are being continued and other policies as well. Um, So it's ongoing. Is it going to stay? What's the political prognosis for its likelihood of staying in its current form? Well, I think it, the likelihood that it stays with its current name is zero. <laughs> it has a, a, it's one of the worst brand names in the yeah. country now because so many people have argued against No Child Left Behind or NCLB. On the other hand, it's almost inconceivable to me, I guess I should be careful when this is being recorded, but it's almost inconceivable to me that we will do away with test-based accountability in some form. Parents like it. It's been, I think, a productive policy, and it clearly fits in with other policies that we might want to have to have regular testing and assessment of schools on the basis of what kids learn. Just to clarify the earlier point, this is just the ongoing act that describes how the federal government interacts with the rest of the school system. So the changes that President Bush put through on testing and accountability stay in place until rev- until revoked. Exactly. Huh. And what has been the research, uh, to the extent it's been done, on the impact of that larger federal role on accountability at the state level? What do we know? Do we know anything yet? We know a little. Um, it turns out to be an extraordinarily difficult thing to think of evaluating NCLB. Uh, When it went into effect in 2002, 
47 states already had some form of test-based accountability in practice. So it's hard to know what's the control group. What would you compare this treatment to? On the other hand, there is evidence from the state actions in the 1990s that states that had strong accountability systems did better on uh, achievement tests, reading and math tests of kids. There's also a little bit of evidence that if you trace individual state performance before and after 2002, that the increases in achievement were larger after 2002 than before for the states where you can consistently uh, trace these. So there's a little bit of evidence on performance. What do you think, you know, as a parent with uh, four school age children uh, and a wife who's a math teacher, I think a lot about you know, what I expect my kids to get out of their school. And doing well on achievement tests probably isn't what I'm looking for. I understand that, that there's a certain minimum standard I expect my kids to get to already. If they weren't getting to that and couldn't reach a certain minimum level of achievement, I would be you know, very upset possibly with the school, maybe with myself. But it's an interesting question. We've probably talked about it before, but let's revisit it. The idea of measuring achievement is extremely difficult, uh, both how you attribute it, how much you attribute to the school, but just the whole idea of what could be measured on a, a paper exam uh, is obviously limited. What's your assessment of how well that has been done? And what about this worry that people will teach to the test? And, of course, there's then a feedback loop to the how the test gets designed and changed so that people make sure that they pass it, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think about that, and, and what research, if any, has been done on it? Well, I think you hit the two big issues of NCLB and three authorization in that um, uh, question. The big issue is measuring learning gains and attributing it to schools. If you're going to use this for accountability purposes, you want to separate out the schools from the parents, from the other kids, from the neighborhoods, and so forth, because you don't want to hold schools responsible for the families and what the families sure. are doing. The second issue is the one that you bring up, is uh, are our tests up, up to doing this? And in many ways, they aren't. Uh, but in other ways, they are. NCLB has had a distinct focus on the bottom end, on proficiency, and making sure everybody should read and be somewhat numerate. Uh, and that's extraordinarily important. It's, yeah. it's obvious we want to do that. But at the same time, we shouldn't ignore other parts of the distribution. Yeah. Your kids, who probably went to kindergarten being able to pass the fourth grade test that I are hope there. Not. I hope it's not that um, easy, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this is something that testing can do, and it can be accomplished. We haven't put much effort into it, but there's an, a simple device. It's uh, what we use for the graduate record exams. You can have adaptive testing so that you give kids a screening test, limited number of questions, that gives some idea of what level of knowledge they have, and then you ask a series of questions within the range that is relevant to them. The problem with current testing is that in order to keep from testing everybody every day for nine hours a day, you have to sample the questions you're after, and uh, you have to have enough questions in the range you're interested in to get sure. meaningful answers. And so you have to change testing. And we haven't worked very hard at that. Some people have, but in general we haven't. And that should be one of the elements of any continuation of test-based accountability. But it's, it, it, in the current world, the test that is administered for accountability, I assume, is a federal test that mainly is checking basic proficiency, not say, higher level synthesizing of ideas or, or things like that? You're almost right. They're all state tests, and that's been one of the issues, is whether individual states should design their own tests Tough and question. have their own standards yeah. oh. and so forth. Um, this gets into very emotional issues, but I think we could do better than we do now of insisting that 
the two testing companies that make all the tests write 50 different versions and sell them as if they're new things to 50 states. Are they different? Uh, Subst substantively different across the states? Well, they all have different titles. Like no, I'm the sure the front of them is different. The front first page is different. <laughs> yeah. The title page, the thing before you break the seal with the pencil. Um, I haven't gone through them in detail. I think that there's a lot of evidence that they have great similarities because fourth grade math in Florida looks a lot like fourth grade math in New York. Yeah, you'd expect it to. Uh, but what about that second question? Is it mainly measuring proficiency? Right now, most of them do, in fact, focus on basic proficiency. And so... Um, there are worse sub things. Suburban uh, uh, schools and suburban families argue that th these tests are a waste of time. And in some ways, they might be because nobody's going to fail them. But the, my response to that is that the suburban schools don't have to rely entirely on that. If they know that that's, everybody can pass that, they ought to have other standards and they can, in fact, uh, eliminate the distortions that are potentially caused by NCLB by putting in their own policies. Yeah, that's true. Uh, now, when we talk about the federal government's role in an area that they really are to, uh, the, the crudest way that you would measure it would be dollars. Um, the proportion, say, of total educational spending coming from the federal government. My assumption is that's increased, but I don't know whether it's a significant number or not. The second would be regulatory implications, which might not have dollar impact, but would have enormous uh, effects on what gets what gets taught. Uh, but just on the dollar front, do you have a rough idea of what proportion of educational spending comes from the federal government now, say, compared to 10 years ago? Uh, right now, about 9% of total expenditures are f from federal dollars. That's up from Five? 6 or 7% yeah. okay. 10 years ago, so that there was an increase with the Bush administration in spending on schools. And was there any uh, state crowding out? Did that uh, free up money that states then decided to reduce? That was an all, wasn't all necessarily gross. That's a gross increase, not the net increase. Do we know? Um, well, we have to discount the current period, which is a, a problem with fiscal turmoil of yeah, the recent true. period. But in general, school spending has been marching up quite consistently, and states have been also spending more. States increased their portion for something we talked about in the past, school finance cases, about 15 or 20 years ago, and they're now spending half, uh, half of funding comes from the states, 10% from the federal government, and 40% local. local. Uh, but they, everybody's been increasing spending on schools up until the last couple of years. But the federal contribution, <laughs> contribution, not a good word, uh, expenditure, is um, relatively small. So a, a state could say, we're not going to take the money, right? We're not going to comply with this No Child Left Behind Act. Is it conceivable? Is it legal? It's legal. Um, and in fact, there were a couple states that threatened that they would not participate in NCLB. But giving up 10% of funding is more than any state wants to do because these amount to a big number. I mean, we're talking about uh, 50 or $60 billion total for the nation, and that, yeah. that, that makes a difference. Real money. Uh, one other thing that's happened in recent years is uh, there's been some innovation of charter schools, and their importance has increased, is my perception. I also have the feeling, and it's interesting that I don't have a good idea of what the magnitude of this is, I have a feeling that homeschooling has increased. Do you know what the relative importance of those two are, and do you think they've made a difference uh, on the public school system? I think they handle roughly the same number of kids, homeschooled and charters. So you were talking about uh, two or three percent of the population in charters and two or three percent in homeschooling. So it's not a big number. No it's a lot of physical number of kids, but it's not a big proportion. It's not a big proportion now. Um, total private schools are ten percent, to put it into perspective, and then we have two or three percent in in charter schools, which are, in some sense, publicly funded uh, private schools. Quasi, in, in quasi uh, uh, public schools. Maybe you should just actually describe 
for our listeners what they are, because not everyone knows. Uh, the charter schools are publicly funded schools that have a charter or a set of rules that allow them to essentially do things differently than local, other local public schools and other schools in the state often. Uh, they're regulated by the states separately so that the rules behind them differ. But the idea is that if these schools do well according to what they said they're supposed to do, they get continue their charter. If they do badly, they don't. So the underlying notion is that this is introducing an alternative and innovative part of the school system that isn't overly regulated. And what are some of the things that they've done that are distinctive from the public school system? Well, some of them look very much like traditional public schools, just with people who say they want to make a difference, and they often are subject, in general, are not subject to unionization and other uh, rules about who has to be hired to be teachers and so forth. Um, so they, many of them participate in that way. Some of the things that they've done, there are s some chains of schools, one of which that has gotten a lot of publicity are KIPP schools. They're called Knowledge is Power Program, or KIPP, um, where they have taken disadvantaged black kids in general in center cities and shown that they can get much improved learning from these kids. Some of the things they do are emphasizing the social aspects of going to school. So they make sure that kids understand what are the rules for behavior that's required and uh, you don't find graffiti in uh, KIPP schools and so forth. They have longer school days. Uh, sometimes they have Saturday programs, longer school years, uh, and they get uh, a group of teachers that are very committed, that are willing to talk to kids at all, and their parents at all hours of day and night. And so they're, they're different in that sense of um, doing, doing things that, you, that a um, real competitor might try to do. Could a public school do most of those things? Can a public school have extended hours? They certainly can take the graffiti down. You know, do you have a feel other than that that they're this slightly different institutional structure? Why are they doing anything that a public school couldn't do? In well, that it, story, depends in that case? it depends on what, how you define can and cannot do. Uh, some of these things are violations of current union contracts. Like but, taking phone calls at night? Taking phone calls at night or working more than three hours in a day or... or uh, on the teacher's part. On the teacher's part. Yeah. Um, that uh, particularly big city contracts specify in great detail how many contact hours a teacher has, what they can, can and cannot do outside of the classroom, whether they have to do lunch duty, to... Uh, a whole range of things. So in a KIPP school or a charter school more generally, there could be more flexibility in what staff is willing to do at what time. Absolutely, and at least at their startup, they're able to find enough people that are willing to do things that are different than the contracts. Now, there is an interesting innovation in that a couple of the KIPP charter schools have gone through union representation votes, and it looks like we might have some unionized KIPP schools, what that means for them is still unclear. Uh-huh. Interesting. Other variations that might be worth noting across the charter school world? Well, the, many Specialized of them, study? Many of them have very specialized programs. They advertise that they're for the arts or their mathematics or their college prep or Learn Chinese. Things, Chinese immersion. Um, these are things, again, that public schools could do if they thought that was worthwhile, they may not be able to find the staff or the committed people that are mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs that are willing to put them in uh, in regular traditional public schools. One thing I've noticed that's peculiar about the charter school movement is the incredible variation in how many, how much charter school there acti activity there is in a particular uh, city, right? It's, there's, there's some cities that have enormous charter school presence, other cities where it's virtually zero. Is that because of varying state regulations with charter schools or just the entrepreneurs? It's a very entrepreneurial opportunity for an educator. 
Well, it, it's two things. The big difference is state regulations. There are nine or ten states that don't allow any charter schools at the current time. And of those that allow charter schools, many of them have caps on the total number of charter schools that can exist in the state. Some of them have regulations of whether you can have essentially chains of charter schools together or whether everybody has to be their own separate school mm -hmm. and things like this. That's part of it. The second part is that somewhat to, to the surprise of many people beforehand, charter schools have tended to serve a very disadvantaged population. They tend to be much more in central cities than out in the suburbs creaming off the good kids. Which is what yeah, one of the worries was when it was started. That was an initial worry, but what charter schools do is serve those that haven't had much choice traditionally. So the people that are stuck in the inner cities and can't move around the way you and I could choose our suburban school district, uh, they're the ones that are being served by this choice. And do we have any evidence that they're doing a good job? One evidence would be that people like to go there, obviously. That, that's, a, I think, an underappreciated measure of quality and performance, but in terms of more standard measures like achievement scores. Well, um, the, my wife, Mackie Raymond, uh, who runs a research center here at Stanford called Credo, just completed a major national study of charter schools. What she finds is that um, there are a group of charter schools that are doing amazingly well. There is a group that's indistinguishable on average from the traditional schools that feed them. And then there's another group that's actually larger than the group that's doing well, that's doing badly, that's this doing noticeably worse. Presumably they're, like any startup business, somebody starts one who doesn't have the administrative skills or whatever it is. Absolutely. I mean, they don't have the administrative skills, they don't have the educational skills, whatever, so that there is a a group that isn't doing well. The open question uh, for economists is whether parental choice is sufficient to, in fact, squeeze out this bottom end, yeah. or whether we want to go back to a regulatory system that somehow reevaluates their charter and, and takes a more uh, aggressive stance on this of whether charter, these charters are allowed to exist or not. But if my kid's in a charter school that's doing poorly, not doing a good job teaching my kid, I could take them out and put them in the regular public school in my neighborhood, or, can I? You absolutely can. And that, and Is so that they, happening? Sure. There's uh, Actually, charter schools have a large turnover of kids both coming in and out, which is one of the uh, difficulties that they face, not only just starting up, but facing a uh, population that's turning over a lot. So that's, that's all possible to do that, no doubt about it. And I should say that these evaluations are also distinctly on the kinds of tests that we talked about before. It could well be that charter schools that are labeled bad in terms of basic proficiency tests are doing other things that you like, that as you parent, mentioned yeah. as a parent. Uh, one of the things that we know that they're doing is providing, in general, more safety for kids. Yeah. And that's something that we, yeah. we parents kind of yeah. like. Yeah, well, for sure. Are there a bunch of them that are highly oversubscribed, where there's an enormous demand for them that are, everyone recognizes that they're exceptionally good? Sure. And, and um, there are large numbers that are oversubscribed, particularly in, in big central cities where uh, people are just looking for an alternative. Uh, any comments on homeschooling? It's, a, it's really an extraordinary phenomenon that it exists at all. It, it's, I'm, uh, and I assume we don't know very much about whether it's effective or not, other than it seems to be really good at producing spelling bee champions, right? I think they dominate, which is an interesting and bizarre thing, right? Whether it's a good idea to be good at spelling. I, I'm not sure whether that's a good investment of one's um, brain. Well, not with spell checkers as they've been developed. Well, but they learn a lot. I think to be a good spelling champion, you have to understand a lot about the roots of words and Latin sure. things. And well, uh, um, what do we know about homeschooling? Until a few years ago, we couldn't tell you within 100% how many kids were in homeschooling because the records were so bad and we had bad surveys. We're getting better at counting them, but most homeschool 
kids take no regular standardized tests, they just go off and do their thing. Um, then we have, you know, USA Today will identify some kid who's in uh, the top 5% of his or her college class and was homeschooled, and, and that's what we know is a, a few exceptions. So we know some kid who um, uh, can't read at the end of age 18 or something. Um, but we don't know much about them. Uh, I share your uh, questions about, you know, how did this phenomenon come about, uh, that it seems like the most inefficient way in some sense to try to teach kids uh, because first, many parents are working and, and that's going on. And secondly, uh, most parents would have a hard time teaching the entire secondary school curriculum. Yeah, well, that, that'd be a big factor, although I have to say, my first thought about homeschooling, and we've considered it for our kids at various times, both of us are, my wife and I are both teachers, so it's, there's a certain natural thought there, and we have not homeschooled our kids, other than the fact that, of course, we homeschool our kids every day. Our kids right. learn lots of stuff at home and in life that aren't, doesn't take place in the classroom, but it, um, what strikes me is how inefficient classroom schooling is, the proportion of time that's spent keeping kids well-behaved. And I, when I think about how little kids learn in school for the time they put in, you know, my first thought is I could teach my kids if I were home. Like you said, it's not, it's not straightforward. If I were home, I think in, in about two to four hours, I could teach them everything they learn in their full day, and then they could spend the rest of the day exploring the world in other ways besides the three R's. I don't know. Well, that's the, the argument, but, you know, it's a small proportion of the population that has PhDs at home. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But, but again, it's kind of an interesting um, uh, evolutionary Hayekian phenomenon of the incredible array of materials available for homeschooling parents, Right. The curricula and, and books and the well, design this, for that. This opens up a, another topic, and that is whether we will finally see the promise of technology come through yeah. in schools because some of the curricula that are available online are really quite amazing. Um, we haven't yet seen it intrude into schools very much, but um, one very of my, threatening. Uh, my colleagues around here who have looked at this, Terry Moe and John Chubb, have done sort of a futurist look at schools and technology. They make the interesting point that um, new technology could revolutionize the politics of schools because it's hard to unionize a dispersed technological uh, no. engine that's that's providing education and it could change what is taught and how it's taught and so forth if um, the politics don't block the introduction of technology. So it's a sort of upcoming battle about whether technology will be let loose on schooling and education or whether it'll be bottled up. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating question I, about how we learn I, it's a mystery to some extent why there isn't more technology in the classroom and in the, and in the educational experience. This enterprise of Econ Talk to me is, uh, I think it's clear from being a part of this now for three years that one way people learn is by listening to people talk about stuff mm -hmm. and in an open-ended way with the chance. What's missing from this is the opportunity for you listeners out there to ask your own questions, but I'm trying to ask questions on your behalf. And when I do my job well, I anticipate the questions you'd ask. And by listening, you learn something. It, it's clear to me as a teacher that there's something unique about the classroom as a, as a learning device. But it's also clear it's unbelievably expensive in both time and money. So it's surprising to me that, in, that there isn't a huge portion of learning that doesn't take place uh, through technology now rather than the face-to-face -face method that's many thousands of years old. <laughs> well, and few people see technology as uh, 
taking a kid and putting them in a closet with a machine. Uh, in, uh-huh. in general, parents and kids and the learning process uh, likes to have real people there interacting. But there are an extraordinarily wide range of things that we could do to use technology better than the teacher. I mean, drilling on math problems in the fourth grade is probably better done by a computer than it is by the math teacher. And even by even most of the good math teachers. But when you think of bad math teachers, the the argument is overwhelming. Not not only bad math teachers, but expensive math teachers. Right, yeah. As you point out. And expensive in time, too. I, I just... The amount of effort we put in there. So, you know, one of the things I, you know, I guess there'd be different answers to why we haven't moved more towards technology. One would be, uh, it's uncertainty or it doesn't work well yet or blah blah blah. But the, uh, the other would be that I hate to mention this, but it's very possible that not much of schools has to do with education, right? Uh, just like it's becoming increasingly clear to me at most universities, the social aspects uh, are equal, if not more important, than the. Uh, than the educational component. Certainly in the K through 12, it also plays a role. It's a, it's a socialization going on there that has something to do with education, but much of it doesn't. Well, this is obviously very important. I mean, part of, part of the way American society works is a common view of society that comes through schools and what goes on in schools and the way we interact with others. On the other hand something that we talked about in a prior econ talk session is that a well-educated a high achieving workforce means a big makes a big difference in terms of the functioning of the US economy yeah and that our future economic well-being is somewhat dependent on kids actually learning in the classroom so they might not be doing it now and they certainly aren't doing it as well as the kids in Finland and a few other places. Um, but it's important that we move in that direction. Yeah, although the, the the non-materialist in me wonders whether we might care less about that if we had a different form of socialization and a different form of learning. And but that's a philosophical <laughs> question for another time. Let's. Um, I want to turn to the. In our remaining time, I want to talk about an issue we, that we raised in our last podcast and that you explore more in, in your recent book, which is the role of the courts in deciding school funding. For those who haven't listened to the last podcast we did, and I encourage you to go listen to that at your leisure, but why don't you summarize uh, what the courts have been doing, or maybe it's better to ask it as summarize what advocates have been trying to get the courts to do in the last few decades. Because it's a part of, of American educational life, I think most people have no, no awareness of. Well, very few people understand how important the courts have been. We titled our book Schoolhouses, Courthouses, and State Houses to emphasize that courthouses are right in the middle of everything that's going on in policy today. Starting in uh, about 1970, there were people who wanted to get the courts involved in the distribution of funding across local districts. The argument was simply an equity one, that some districts, because we raised money locally where different communities had different fiscal capacity, uh, led to wide variations in what was spent on schools and that this was inherently inequitable. There were a large number of these equity cases that actually began here in California with a case called Serrano versus Priest that worked to equalize funding across districts. They were all um, brought from the very beginning on state constitutions that required uh, states to fund the schools, and, and so this was an equitable part. After 20 years of these court cases, almost every state had addressed the issue. Some courts had ruled that the state was doing okay and others that it wasn't. But they basically started to wind down. Advocates uh, for schools and school funding turned to a different view, and that was that state constitutions generally required more funding for schools to make them adequate 
and they brought in to play evidence that some kids weren't learning, some kids weren't reading well, and it must be the fault of the funding system that doesn't provide sufficient resources. And so for the last almost 20 years, we've had a range of court cases that have tried to address an issue that traditionally was done by the legislatures, and that is deciding how much should be appropriated for schools. Which is shocking, really, in a democracy that, that the courts took that, again, it's not the courts acting, but that advocates use, were able to use the courts. to, And they had a big effect, right? Oh, it's had a huge effect um, that large numbers of states have had to increase their funding and have been under court control. Uh, New Jersey is the best example. It entered the courts in early 1970s and is still being uh, having educational decisions and financial decisions overseen by the courts today. And what does that mean, overseen by the courts? Meaning they have to get their approval, or is it a more micro level than oh, that? Oh, it's much more than that. Um, it's, it's almost done in New Jersey, apparently. The courts have almost said that they'll get out of uh, this. But un until v uh, last spring, um, there were 31 districts in New Jersey that are called Abbott districts after the name of the court case that were given essentially unlimited spending capacity. All they had to do was come into the courts and say, we need more money for X. And the court said, oh, I, we, we agree with that. State, provide more money to these 31 Abbott districts. And so they had court cases that involved whether preschool education should be provided to all of the kids in Abbott districts by the state. They had court cases about what uh, the class size should be in Abbott districts and so forth. Wouldn't the legislatures in those states that are getting those court mandates rise up in arms because that's taking money out of their, that they get to dispense, right, and they've lost control of it? Well, New Jersey's a funny case because there are only 31 of 500 plus districts that were being watched by the court. So what the legislature did was to screw down on all the remaining districts that weren't Abbott districts. And so you can see in the spending that Abbott districts were spending much, much, much more than non -Abbott. comparable but non-Abbott districts. And this is a, an example of the idiocy of our school finance system. Um, how did you become an Abbott district? Well, you had to have large concentrations of poor kids, but obviously in New Jersey there's more than 31 districts with large concentrations of poor kids. What you had to also demonstrate is that you'd done badly in the past, that achievement was historically low. In other words, if you do badly enough, we'll give you unlimited funds. And presumably the other side of that is, if you do better, then we'll take away those funds, yeah. uh, which is not the standard economic view of, of the way we want incentives to be operated. Yeah. So are we, would you say overall, you know, that you said there was a flurry of activity in the 70s, it started in the 70s and then incur increased again in the 90s, is it slowing down or are the courts more involved than ever or... In the last few years, there's a little bit of sign that it's slowing down and maybe the courts are getting more reluctant to, to be in this. Through the 90s and into the early 2000s, every court case that was brought was won by the plaintiffs that, where the courts, in my uh, interpretation, simply said, we do have an educational problem. The legislature hasn't licked this, so we might as well try to help ourselves. Yeah. And they uniformly found in favor of it. What we did in uh, this recent book was to actually look at some of the large court cases, New Jersey, Wyoming, Kentucky, which are always labeled as the big adequacy cases that started this whole movement and had lots of funding. We were did, called adequacy because it was, they were ruled inadequate in yes. advance of the court action. Right. The, the court cases said that they were inadequate in that. And that was based on some kind of achievement scores or Often anything. some achievement scores, but in New Jersey case, I don't think they had any, any achievement data. They just provided evidence to suggest, well, there are poor kids that aren't graduating from high school and other things, so we okay. have to take care of this. Um, we did what I think was a unique 
thing in this book. And we tried to look at if they got the money, did they get better? Mm-hmm. Did, Good question. Did things improve? Right. Which seemed like a natural, but in uh, 35 to 40 years of these court cases, there is extraordinarily no little evidence. Nobody bothered to look or, or nobody wanted to look. Sure. Um, and what we found is that in the large um, court cases and court rulings that pump billions of dollars into New Jersey, Kentucky, and Wyoming, there's very little evidence that the kids did any better relative to other states where there was no such cases. The only place where there was a major court case where performance seemed to improve was Massachusetts. And that by our interpretation, is um, something that might have been expected because Massachusetts did a whole series of other structural policy changes like improving the accountability systems, putting in tougher exit exams to schools, and a variety of other programs, and that more money in a better system has some effect, is our interpretation. Uh, But most court cases have not said anything about what else you do. They've just said, the one thing we can monitor and see is how much you spend, spend more. Yeah. Now, you said in three of the the major states, no no measured improvement. But you mentioned earlier it's hard to measure improvement. It's hard to measure the separate impact of of the quality of the schools. Um, What is your assessment of the reliability of your assessment? It is yours, so I understand you. It is ours, so I mean, yeah. I always <laughs> think that my my work is pretty reliable. No but doubt. <laughs> no, I'm sure you do. You should, because it's your work, and that would be a bad thing if you didn't. So, well, we but did what are very, some of the questions that that you think are left unanswered, or that might be uncertain about what you found? Well, we did actually a fairly simple analysis, and it could always be improved. But what we looked at was performance on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is commonly called NAEP, or the Nation's Report Card. This is a set of standard tests in reading and math that's been given fourth and eighth grade at the state level for uh, basically every two or four years since 1990. We looked at the growth in performance on reading and math at different levels in each of these states compared to the growth of, for the nation as a whole. So that um, we tried to look at, are they learning more relative to people who didn't have this great uh, court case behind but them? But some, some of the nation as a whole did have increases in expenditures without the court case. Absolutely. So there's, there's some normal activity um, that's going on. In fact, Almost all of the nation had some increases in spending. It was just in these cases the st- court stepped in and got a lot more. You probably what, what's don't. What's the magnitude? What are the magnitudes? You probably don't realize that um, Wyoming is a top five spending state in the nation. I did not in, realize on a that. Per pupil basis. When did that happen? Uh, it happened after this court case. Which was... It started ni- in 1996 was the major change in the funding streams. What were they before? They were they top were, five after. What were they before? Um, they were right around the middle, okay. uh, if I have this right, and and then they just shot up. They were a little bit above the national average, and then they shot up to the top. Um, they were basically told in a court case, uh, be visionary and unsurpassed. Yeah. Well, you can imagine <laughs> that if 50 courts say you should be unsurpassed, that this creates quite a, a, a race. Yeah. Uh, well, you want every child to be above average, uh, not just the children of Lake Wobegon. So that's you know that's reasonable. So you have um, the, the questions on this analysis, or you could have big changes in the populations of some states. Although that yeah, doesn't Wyoming's seem to be probably that. pretty stable. And in particular, if you disaggregate by race of the students, you find the same story. In particular, black kids in these states didn't do as well as the nation in general, even though they were always identified as the recipients. The poor, disadvantaged kids were the recipients of this. That's pretty depressing. Uh, it is, and, and it comes back to this basic issue. Is first, uh, 
I don't think the courts are well suited to make these kinds of policies, uh, leaving aside your interpretation of the constitutions. They just don't have the capacity. But secondly, it points out um, in an underlying theme here is that the legislatures haven't particularly done a good job in the past, that they need to do better. And um, our simple answer is funding and other policies have to pay attention to what kids learn. It has to pay attention to the outcomes of schooling and not to how many inputs, the resources, the spending per pupil that we put in. So what do you think would be a better system? Uh, I know you advocate one in the book. Um, how could we do this better? How could we make uh, outcomes more uh, relevant for funding? Well, th um, there are two overwhelming uh, Part of our overarching ideas here. One is that uh, we shouldn't try to separate finance from policy. Um, in particular, in these court cases and other cases, it's always been argued, well, we're just talking about how you raise money and how much you raise. We're not talking about how you use it. Um, we think that that's a bad idea because you end up with things like the Abbott districts where you provide incentives to do badly or at yeah. least not to do particularly well. Um, so that's one idea. And the second idea is that your policies and your finance have to reward good performance and not bad performance. So uh, what's it all amount to? First, you have to have an accountability system that measures whether kids are learning or not. That gets back to the very first things we talked about. Secondly, um, as a base case, you want to make sure that schools have sufficient and equitable resources, by which I mean that, that we have to make sure that there is base funding for districts and that um, kids that are more difficult to educate get uh, more resources to come with them, so disadvantaged kids or whatever, uh, that you have special education kids and so forth, ought to get more base resources. But once you've provided base resources, then you ought to give more to schools that do better more to teachers that do better, more to administrators that do better, and not reward failure, as we tend to do now. Um, so those are the, the major outlines of what you need to do and how you put it together. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one thing that I left out that, that we've had underlying this whole discussion. To make this whole thing effective, you also have to have more local control and local decision making rather than making it at the state capital. And part of that is getting parents involved through choices, uh, choices of both of what schools they go to, what districts they can go to, and of how much they spend locally. So you have to build in the ability to parent, of parents to get involved in setting the incentives right. Yeah, and I think the my favorite neglected thing about schooling is uh, the fact that it's given away with no out-of-pocket to the public students, so the parents pay nothing out-of-pocket, and I think um, that has a big impact on their involvement. Well, I, I, let me just follow up, though. I mean, here in California is probably the worst example nationally, but it comes out other places. We essentially have full state funding in California, and so local districts don't have any choice to speak of in how much they spend on their schools. This leads parents to withdraw if they are not involved in this and they can't, in fact, uh, reward or punish local school districts for their performance through funding decisions, you find that they aren't very much involved. No, re no question to my mind how that and other centralized policies in California lead California to be the 47th state in the union in terms of performance. As measured on, on like NAEP or other? NAEP. Uh, NAEP yeah. Test, yeah. Um, so how can you solve, it seems to me we have a difficult uh, political dilemma. You know, my preference would be to get government out of schooling entirely, or at least certainly out of the provision of schooling. Maybe you could have some sort of subsidy role. Uh, that would be a much better solution to the current world, where dollars would follow s students, uh, not schools. But how are you going to get to a world with the kind of incentives you'd like 
in a public system that inherently is going to deal with these issues of funding differences. So I like your point that we want more local control and more local influence for all kinds of reasons. But in our beginning of our conversation, we said local money is about 40% of, of the total. And presumably a lot of the state and federal money, that remaining 60% is, is compensatory. It's trying to equalize spending in certain districts. So given we have that urge, how, how are we going to get to a world where good schools get rewarded? Well, um, first, uh, let me speak to local funding and so forth. I mean, since the 1920s, almost every state in the union has, in fact, tried to make up for districts that don't have much fiscal capacity by compensatory to the district related to the tax base and so on. And I think that that makes sense to maybe not neutralize uh, individual district differences. You'd like that actually for some incentive purposes, uh, but to ameliorate some of the discrepancies we have in the tax bases across districts so that people can uh, have a sort of more equitable uh, ability to raise funds. So how do we get uh, to a system that in fact rewards uh, this? Um, I think that First of all, we have to capitalize on the fact that almost everybody in the nation today thinks we have a schooling problem and that we have to deal with it. And most everybody in the nation portrays it in part with the fact that on international math and science tests and other evidence, we have kids that aren't very competitive. We have to capitalize on that to get our legislatures in the right mood. Take a little risk. And then we have to convince legislatures that simple economic incentives are important for schools as they are for uh, the remainder of the economy and convince them that the rest of the economy works quite well, thank you, because the incentives are a lot better than they are in schools. And what we have to do from state capitals is to try to get some of those similar incentives. I mean, the the argument for uh, vouchers and Milton Friedman's basic idea was that there's no reason that the public has to produce education. It might want to worry about funding kids and so forth. Um, I obviously accept that as a general principle. I think it's, we're so far away from that at 90% of our population going to public schools, uh, that we're not going to go to a free and open system of vouchers, but we can, in fact, introduce both more choice through expanded charter schools and other things, and introduce some of the market-like incentives through other mechanisms that are, in fact, supported by state governments and local governments. Yeah, it's always challenging when we look at other areas where uh, people try to withhold or provide funds based on carrots and sticks. It's it's hard to do. Uh, the World Bank hasn't been very successful at it, right? They have a similar idea that we'll, we'll punish people who have bad policies and don't give money and uh, reward people who have good policies. It doesn't seem to work very well. So it might work better in the domestic world. Um, it's possible. No, it's hard. It's, it's obviously hard, but you can do some gross things. I mean, for example, there's been a lot of recent discussion about performance pay for teachers and administrators. Yeah. Um, that's something that you don't want to set in state capital. You don't want to set salary schedules in the state capital because they're just out of touch with what's going on in districts and what you might be able to do. You want to set that locally. But you can envision a system where the California state legislature had a pot of money that could go to districts to support the bonus part, performance part of a salary schedule if it was negotiated locally um, by the district and met certain parameters, such as um, a substantial portion of the performance pay had to be based upon objective information about learning and just leave that 
in a, in a fairly general way. You'd have to fill it in, of course, at some point, but uh, not specify how you do it or the characteristics of this plan, but that the state is going to support an idea of better incentives in schools. Well, yeah, it's an interesting, you know, political challenge, obviously. The we actually have, uh, I should interject here, that experiment is starting right now, and we'll be able to see it in the next couple of years. The federal stimulus money to education has a portion of it, $4.35 billion, that gives discretion to the Secretary of Education, Washington, to dispense it. Huh. He has announced that he will give this money to states that show that they're doing things that we think are good policies, reform policies. And quite surprisingly, they're policies that you and I probably agree with. He says, I will not give this, to money, this money to states that can't track the performance of students and can't link the performance of students to schools and teachers. I will not give this to states that restrict charter schools and the amount of choice. And I will be encouraged to give this to states that experiment with various performance pay for teachers or other ways to control keeping good teachers and getting rid of bad teachers. So he has said this several times publicly. He has said start. this. Um, <laughs> sure it means it, but yeah. The President of the United States has said this, and both of them have said it to the National Education Association at their meetings, hmm. not something that, they, that the yeah. NEA would normally like, right. um, but they've kept saying it. Hmm. And so uh, whether they can pull it off is something we'll wait and see, but they have certainly started to use their bully pulpit and today, $4.35 billion looks like a big number to some states. Yep. Um, uh, they've just started to suggest that their money backs up their bully pulpit. We'll see. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And one thing he didn't mention, and I want to make sure we talk about it before we, we're almost out of time, uh, there's a recent court case that does deal with this funding issue in a, in a more skeptical way than in the past. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Um, the, the, uh, that's a really interesting case. It's actually a federal court case called Flores that was uh, handled in Arizona on English language learners, kids who needed extra help with English. Um, and it was um, argued under a federal statute that said that districts had to, in fact, pay attention to English language learners. Uh, for a long time, uh, Arizona has been under federal court order to put more money into ELL uh, programs. Uh, and the state recently argued that, in fact, we've put both more money into it, we've changed our programs, and we have some performance results. Can't we be let out from underneath federal court supervision on this matter? The district court has, has said consistently, no, we'd rather keep supervising <laughs> yeah. you. Um, but it went to the Supreme Court in this spring, spring of 2009, and the five to four majority of the court came out with a very strongly worded uh, statement that said, we ought to pay attention to student performance and not how much money we put in. Um, I was quite pleased that it cited some of my work and it cited this new book in the court case, even though the, the book came out only two weeks before the opinion was released, um, right. that said, um, uh, you know, look, there's a lot of evidence that money is not a good index of what the schools are doing, and so um, that's what you ought to pay attention to. Some, some encouragement, a little bit of optimism. Well, now, the, the problem is, of course, that um, the, the court cases we talked about before have been done in the 50 separate states, and this was a federal court case. On the other hand, the U.S. Supreme Court has a lot of influence on yeah. <laughs> uh, courts around the nation, and hopefully uh, lower courts in the 50 states 
and Supreme Courts in the lower 50, in the other 50 states will look at the reasoning behind this that is absolutely the right reasoning. I want to close with a political economy question. You mentioned a few minutes ago that we ought to take advantage of the fact that everybody agrees that we have a school problem in the United States. I find it fascinating how issues come and go. Right now, we're focused on <clears throat> the economy as a whole, uh, the financial system, the health care system, the energy system, global climate change. I've heard very little noise about education. That $4.35 billion maybe made some noise at the NEA, the National Education Association. But I find it interesting how an issue like schooling, which to me is a, obviously I care a lot about it. I may not be the best judge of it, but it seems to me to be a very important thing where we could do a lot better. And it, it sort of comes on the front burner and then it drops off and it, people sort of forget about it. And It's not because the schools have gotten a lot better. So isn't it? I just wonder how much potential there really is for change now for, for a while. Well, maybe I spend too much time looking at schools, but I, um, I see a consistent public interest in schools that is traced back at least to 1983 when there was a major government report called a nation at risk that said our schools are in trouble and we're in trouble because of our schools. Um, when the president wanted to sell his stimulus package, he labeled $100 billion of that education because education can sell, yeah. even though much of it is bricks and mortar and other things that have little to do with learning, with yeah. learning. knowledge, um, <laughs> wisdom. Uh, and I don't think that education is currently off the uh, mind of people or will be off. Now, it gets pushed aside by today's events, which newspapers and the media concentrate on today's events. But the national interest that comes through in surveys uh, about the quality of education is very high. Uh, and it, it has stayed high, remarkably high. My guest today has been Eric Hanischek of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Eric, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thanks for having me again. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.